And we're in week four of our equipping series, and it's, and it's healthy stewardship. And it's looking at stewardship from a biblical perspective. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, good stewards reject mammon and choose God. So I want to bring you up to speed on where we are. Week one in this series, it was who's the owner? And that's important for the principle of a biblical stewardship is understanding who truly owns everything. And we know that the owner of everything is the creator of everything and the redeemer of everything, and that's God. You know, actually, I think we all admitted that when, we, when someone lends us something, when we borrow somebody's car or whatever, we actually take better care of it. We return it in the same condition or better condition. This is what, because God's the owner of everything, He allows us to be the manager of His resources. With that, He expects us to take good care of those things. Week two was faithful stewards are blessed. Faithful stewards are blessed. We went through Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, and we discovered that the kingdom is not socialist, that they don't spread everything equally amongst everybody. You get according to your ability. And that God gives us the opportunity to learn to steward well, to steward better, so that he can trust us with more. Last week was the principle of first. The first fruits, the first giving. The first giving redeems the rest. Jesus was the first fruit. Jesus redeems the rest. If you find yourself and you, and you get your paycheck and your first money goes to the electric bill, Hillco cannot redeem the rest of your money. The principle of first is so important. Tonight we're going to talk about, like I said, good stewards reject mammon and they choose God. They reject mammon and they choose God. You know, it's so important. And like I said in the last class, Joe went through and he talked about the principle of first and why we tithe, why we give. And tonight I want to, let's go to the next step. Uh, in tithing. And let's dig a little deeper into the heart of why stewardship is so important to us as believers. And you know, it's simple. Stewardship is about relationship. It's about relationship. It's one of the most important things to understand about stewardship. I, on Sundays, I, I encourage the body when you, when you give, when you bring your tithes, your offerings. It's not like paying the waitress at the restaurant. It's not like paying a subscription or a movie ticket. Don't just dole out the requested amount, but pray about what it is that the Holy Spirit wants you to give. Pray whatever those attachments that are keeping you from that relationship with God. Break those tethers, break those bonds. And it's not out of obligatory giving. It's not about law. It's about relationship. And when you think about it, I mean, just let it sink in. Like, God desires to be in relationship with you. And so you say, I dig it. I get it. God wants to be in relationship. But why God involved money? <laughs> right? How is tithing connected to relationship? Well, I will tell you that every good manager has a solid relationship with the owner. If you work in a business or you're a boss, or you're a manager, or a supervisor, every successful business has a seamless flow of communication between the owner and the manager. God is the owner of everything. We get to manage it all. And to be able to learn to manage and steward well requires a solid relationship. It's not giving or tithing for the sake of exchanging currency. It is a transference of relationship and trust and faith. God owns it all. God trusts it all with you. The only holding back he does is to protect you from getting it over your head. I've shared before, 73% of the multi-million dollar lottery winners within three to five years file bankruptcy. Why? They were not prepared. They were not ready to steward that amount of money. They used to say, more money, more problems. No money, no problems. Now, I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe. But then somewhere in the middle is, is where we belong. 
So I want you to, I want you to learn to look at that, that tithing, stewardship, is a relationship with God. I trust you because I love you. And I love you and I want to grow you and teach you. And just like we did with our kids growing up, I'm going to give you a little responsibility. And when you do it well and you're reliable, I'm going to give you a little more responsibility. And that responsibility goes into an allowance and things like a car. And, and this is the same thing God's doing for us. He is protecting us. But the key to this is, is understanding that it is a relationship. So if we've got to think of it in owner and manager, communications is the key, think of it about that. And so what I want to, with that thought in mind, I want, to, I want to just prompt you. A lot of times we feel like, well, I just, I just can't, you know, the, men's, the, the ends don't make, they don't match the means. We're always running short or we're always worrying about this. And I'm not just talking money. I'm talking about everything. You feel like your marriage is running dry? You feel like relationships are struggling? I don't know, man. We don't talk like we used to. Man, something must be going on. Well, let me ask you, are you stewarding those relationships well? Are you having those open communication channels? Are you praying to the Lord, asking to reveal to you, to give you the wisdom to generate wealth, as in relationships and friendships and the fruits of the Spirit? But what I'll, I'll say, probably what we do, is instead of sitting down with the owner, we put them on hold. On. You know, like, I'll get with you next week when things aren't so busy. And that time lost is time that's never going to be regained. What I want to challenge you, and we're going to talk about this, is to deepen your relationship. Set an appointment. Set an appointment with the owner. If you're looking for a, a raise or you're looking to, to, to come out of a current season, Set that scheduled appointment to purposely and intentionally meet with the owner, to meet with the Lord. I want to give you an example of, of God's desire to meet with us, to meet with his managers, if we've got to put it in a, in a, in a sense of that. It's uh, Exodus 19, 10 through 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now God is setting an appointment to meet with the managers of his resources. He's telling Moses, his project manager, you go get those people ready. You get your crew of managers and stewards of my stuff and get them, consecrate them. Get them ready. Let them wash their clothes. Let them cleanse themselves. Let them come prepared to meet with the boss. And on that day, God kept his appointment and he spoke. Exodus 19, 19 tells us, And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. What I will tell you is if you're willing to commit the time, if you're willing to prepare yourself to come before the Lord, He will speak to you. He will speak to you. We've all either been a boss or had a boss. And we see the good relationships and the bad relationships. Nothing's changed. We've got to come ready to communicate to receive. And this is, this is what God wants us to do. If you find yourself in a funk, if you find yourself in obscurity, if you find yourself like, I just don't know. I just don't know. Set yourself an appointment. I mean, make an appointment. Amen. God always comes to a prepared atmosphere. I mean, what would you think if you showed up here on Sunday and we were unprepared. Ellie didn't come, and Ariana overslept, and, and, and you know, Lee and I went back to Biloxi for another, for another pot of gumbo, and, and the door was just unlocked. What are you going to think? You probably wouldn't come back because we were unprepared. Now, I'll tell you, some churches, or they call themselves churches, they don't, they don't have any planning. 
They're like, oh, we're just going to let the Spirit lead. We're going to let the Spirit lead. But I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit doesn't lead in disorder. In our churches or in our lives. God is a God of order. God is a God of structure. God is a God of a kingdom, and this kingdom has rules and structure and order. And it operates on legal authority. And God expects us as, a, as heavens, citizens of heaven, to operate within that structure and that order. And it's not for suppression. It's for protection and promotion and elevation. What I'm going to challenge you tonight if you set an appointment every week to go to lunch and to go to breakfast and to go to this with people, why don't you do it with God? Amen. Are you preparing a time and a place to meet with Him? I will tell you that, that now that we, we're getting semi-settled in our home, and, and Leah, I say Leah's got a big closet. I've got a, I've got a box. And, but you know what? I get up early. I get up early. And we purposely put a little transom window in, window in there so we don't have to have the light. We have natural light. Uh, and at the time, it's moonlight and, and the security lights. But that's I go in there, and I have an appointment with God every morning. And, and I come prepared. And I come prepared. And He's never not spoken to me. He's never not spoken to me. I challenge you to do the same thing. Get yourself a set time and a set place. Consecrate yourself. And then wash your clothes. Come before the Lord prepared. I want to challenge you. Set an appointment. Get your phone out. You go to a date. You go to a time. And you name it what you want. Get with God or appointment with the big boss or whatever you want to name it. I, every, Lee, Lee and I share every, every appointment I share with her. You do the same with your spouse or somebody else. Do that. So they don't interrupt you, so they know that you've got something scheduled. You know, if you need a time and you're like, I don't know, I'm so busy. Well, then you can kill two birds with one stone. Monday nights from 6 to 7 o'clock, Pony comes and opens the, the sanctuary, and it's a, it's, a, oh, it's a prayer room. Let that be your time. Amen. If you're like, well, I can't find a place. My wife's always, or my husband's always chasing me around. They won't leave me alone. Well, come here. Let this be your appointment with the Lord. What I learned is on paper, on purpose. If you don't write it down, it's not going to happen. We were bragging on Edgar and Anna last week. When you mention something, their phones come out immediately. They're pinning you down to a date and a time. And we, we've learned from you. We want to be better in that. On paper, on purpose. Because a missed appointment is a disappointment. If I don't get up and I don't go to that closet... My day's, my day's shot. I know that I've missed some value in the day because I missed an opportunity to meet with the Lord. He was waiting for me, but I missed the opportunity. I'm challenging you to be intentional, to be purposeful. If you've done it before, you know what I'm telling you is the truth, and it works. If you've never done it before, give it a shot. I'm telling you, it works. Not because I said so, but because Scripture says so. The Lord is waiting for you to set an appointment and be there. Don't be late. I had a young man that I'm discipling one-on-one, -on -one, and I said, be at my house Monday at 6 o'clock. Come to your house? Yeah, I want you to come to my house. Because I want you to see my house that is quiet and it's peaceful and it's clean. I want to make an impression upon him as a young, early young married man. This is how I live my life. And it's open and transparent and welcoming for you. But be here at 6 o'clock. You know when he got there? <laughs> well, it wasn't 6 o'clock. And it was our first meeting. So we got room to grow. But don't be late for your appointment with God. Honor him with your first fruit, your first effort. And with that said, and Joe's message last week, give him your first. Give him your first. I've told you before, my first words when I wake up, Thank you, Lord. I've offered my first fruit, my first prayer of the day, my first words of the day. Thank you, Lord. And my last words. I challenge you to do that. I encourage you to do it. You will see a transformation in your life. It centers everything. So figure out your time and your date. Put it in your phone. I would say when we finish this class, before you leave here today, 
I would love if everybody has physically set a calendar appointment to meet with the Lord. So let's go. i ask you a question. How do you think your life would change if you allow God to speak into all areas of your life, in- including your finances? Amen. And I mean, I don't mean like the, the religious thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, I want you to think about it for a second. How would your life change if you truly allow God to speak into all areas of your life? I had breakfast with a man this morning. You know those breakfast slash lunches? You start off at 8.30 and the waitress is like, we're closing afternoon. And you're still sitting there. I have one of those today. And, but I challenged this man. I said, before you text anybody, before you answer a phone call, different people calling, I said, ask the Holy Spirit if he wants you to answer that call. Ask the Holy Spirit if he wants you to text this person. And then you'll start developing a relationship with the Lord. You'll learn to listen. There's people in my life that I love, and I want to text them. And the Holy Spirit says, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to open a door into your life that's not meant to be open at this season. I want you to be intentional and purposeful about pursuing the Lord. I want you to to let God speak into every area of your life. I mean every area of your life. Do I text them back or do I text them at all? I've told you, uh, even the shirts that I wear, that house that we're living in, that's a miracle house. I'll share that testimony one day. You know why we're in that house? Because Lee and I were going to go look at some homes, and the Lord said, don't wear that T-shirt, wear that T-shirt. And it was an old gray Five Stones church T-shirt. Okay, I'll do what you tell me to do. We walk into a place, and there's a guy over there. What's that church? Oh, we just play. Me and this guy, he's the owner of the company. He goes, I want to build a home for you. Matter of fact, I want to bless you with things in that home because I listen to the Holy Spirit. I allow God to speak into every aspect of my life. And you think, a t-shirt? Why not? What about a burning bush? What about a donkey? He'll use if you allow him and you'll listen to him. So where's your attention focus? Let's move on. Are you allowing God to speak into your finances or are you listening to someone or something else? Look, Everybody's going to tell you what to do with your money. First, they're going to tell you where to send your money so they can tell you what to do with their money. This stuff is free. I want to go to Luke 16, uh, 10, 13. I'm going to break it into two pieces. And it starts off, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in the large things. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest in the greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches in heaven? And if you were not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? Like, that's hard hitting. That's hard hitting. And I always, I relay this. I use this for spouses when we do marriage counseling. If you are not stewarding your spouse well, if you are not stewarding your relationship well, and you're like, well, why I don't have any friends? Why I'm not making any headway in the job? Why I'm not? Because God's given you that person. He has entrusted you with this person to steward well. Same thing with finances. I'm always on the short end. Yeah, because you're not stewarding well what I gave you. And we've got to work and operate in integrity at all times. Integrity is simply having the courage to do the right thing all the time. It's easy to cut corners nowadays. But God knows if we're cutting corners with the little things and we're wondering why our fish aren't full of nets and the big things. Always with integrity. And to round that out, the scripture says, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other and you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Other translations say mammon. See, Jesus made it, Jesus himself made it very clear. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we say, well, what's mammon? Well, that's a good question. It's a rooted, it's an Aramaic word, and it means riches. It originated from the Syrian god of riches, whose name is what? Mammon. Mammon. Jesus is referring to riches as well as false gods of greed. You cannot worship material things and the supernatural God. 
You cannot do it. So what are the meanings and the implementation? Impl- imp- what are the meanings when we're talking about mammon? Well, we're talking about wealth and materialism. The Lord's got no issue with you having money. His issue is with money having you. You see, it's a spiritual warning from Jesus. He uses the term mammon purposely and intentionally. It's a duality of meaning, material wealth and the satanic God of greed. There's a duality of of, of meaning. He is warning us against the danger of prioritizing spiritual wealth, um, material wealth over spiritual well-being. That demonic attachment to money, to greed, is what threatens your spiritual well-being. And serving mammon can lead to a divided heart, making it difficult to fully serve God. This is why last Sunday we talked about that there will be no marriage as we know it on earth in heaven. Why? Because there can be no relationships after the resurrection. There can be no relationships to detract you from your relationship with God. We know what the scripture says about a double-minded person. And, and, and mammon splits the loyalties. It splits the lo- Not because there's money, but because there's demonic attachment to money. So how do we avoid the trap of serving mammon or material wealth? It requires intentional actions. It re- requires, Romans 12 too, a renewing of the mind. You've got to retrain your brain to look at money in this way, to look at material wealth in this way, to look at promotion and career advancement in this way. It's a, it takes renewing your mind, retraining your brain. And, and I think there's some, yeah, there's some uh, bullet points up there. But these are some practical ways that we can do this. The first thing is to, give, to, to practice generosity, to give regularly. Every time I give a message on, uh, on giving, look, you see people, they get a little, you know, like they just had that lemon squeeze. And I'm like, if your first thought is your bank account and not your relationship with the Lord, then we got some deliverance issues we need to walk through. But how do we break through this serving mammon? Where's your heart? That's all really giving is. It's where's your heart? What's your temperature? Attachment to money versus relationship and love for the Lord. Is that dollar bill more important than that anointing and that prophetic word you'll receive from walking in obedience? So how do we break it? Practice generosity. The other is, is live simply. Adopt a lifestyle where experiences and relationships mean more than material possessions. You know, we, we taught our kids after we taught ourselves. We go on vacation, and you show up, and it's beautiful scenery, and you pull out your phone. And I'm like, hey, 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 enjoy the experience. Enjoy the opportunity. So we've learned to live simply. Stewardship, which is this whole series, this is what we're learning to do, is manage your resources wisely. I will say this, and, and it's kind of funny, but I'm, la- I'm glad because I know the message is resonating. I had a person that attends the church and somebody who watches online over the last week come and confess that their cars, one was over 5,000 miles, they saw the light on their car, and the other looked up on the sticker on the window, and they were both about 5,000 miles over on their oil change. And they realized they had not been stewarding the gift of that vehicle that the Lord had given them. This is how practical application stewardship is. Managing your resources well. Managing your resources well. Contentment. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. My spiritual father, Larry Titus, I was reading a book. I'm I'm helping him write the book and publish it. And and he said he used to have the spiritual gift of criticism. And he said he was so anointed in the spiritual (laughs) gift of criticism before the Lord convicted him. And he intentionally adopted an attitude of gratitude. That will break the hold of mammon. Uh, Spiritual disciplines, prayer, and Bible study. Y'all, we talk about it all the time. You cannot know the power of God until you know what the Word of God says about God's power. And you only know that by reading God's Word. We see these influencers on social media. I want to be like that. You can be greater than that, but not by imitating that, by learning the Scripture, by learning the nature and character of God so you experience the power of God. You've got to read the Word of the Lord. I want to round it up with community. 
Scripture tells us, do not forsake gathering with the saints. It is good to be amongst other believers. It is good to be in a posture of accountability. The next is purposeful living. Seek God's will. Well, how do I know God's will? Set yourself an appointment and show up ready, and you'll know His will. He will speak to you. He will speak His will, but only when you're, you're willing to listen. When you honor God's time with your time, God will speak to you, but be ready to receive. My spiritual father taught me, don't come, don't come to me without a notebook in your hand. And, I, and I, if I've ever sat with any of you men for lunches, or so, I always come with a notebook. When you go to meet with the Lord, His Word is important enough for you to write down. Come prepared. And the last thing is focus on your path. Resist the urge to compare your life and your possessions with others. Comparison, it leads to envy and dissatisfaction. That old keeping up with the Joneses. If I knew who the Joneses were, we'd run them out of town. You've got to focus on your path. A man I was meeting with this morning talking about his ministry, he said he's really distracted and discouraged. And I said, I said, you know, you're, you're like a sniper. And the Lord wants your eye to the scope. But what you're doing, you're swatting flies. You keep pulling your eye off the scope so you don't focus on the target. You don't focus on God's will for your life. You're busy swatting flies. I said, you're no good to anybody. But the devil, you put your eye on that scope. You keep your eye on what God's placed you on. And, and, and I told him, you choose the life that you want to live and say no to everything else. Say no to everything else. You want to be a good steward of God's resources? Then that's what you do. But you say no to everything else. I will tell you, me, I'm a natural, I'm a pleaser. I will not tell you no. And it's a downfall. Of mine. I don't say a downfall. I'm working on it. But I'm a pleaser. I want you to be happy. But you know what? If I'm over here doing this and I'm doing that, then I'm not doing what the Lord's called me to do. I've got to keep my eye on the scope. Amen. You do the same thing. You see God's will. You choose the life you want to choose according to God's will in a, in a, in a partnership with God's will. And then you say no to everything else. Be, be cautious. Protect your anointing. Now, the last thing I want, to, I want to make this point is God blesses money that has been submitted to Him. God blesses resources that have been submitted to Him. God blesses time that's been submitted to Him. He's not going to um, use or bless anything that's been sent to, to replace Him. We talked about it earlier. Everything God created, Satan counterfeits. Satan cannot create anything. He can only counterfeit it. Money is a counterfeit. The attachment is counterfeit. Money doesn't love you. Money has no emotion. Open your wallet. It will walk away. And it won't even text you to say goodbye. But we attach an unhealthy relationship to money. You see, but what you submit to the Lord, that first redeems the rest. That's why the devil does not devour your resources. And we go to Malachi 3.11. And it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. The devourer of what? Of your resources. I will rebuke the devourer. So that he will not what? Destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine uh, fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What you submit to and commit to the Lord. He protects. He protects. This is the promise from Malachi. Your righteous worship of giving God first fruits allows your tithe to redeem the rest of your money and your resources. God honors that. Like I said, Joe taught about the principle of first last week. And I know it's tough. I do. We've been there. We've been there. When I started as a cop in the, in the Late 80s. Or I was making 10000 something dollars a year. But you know what? God was always faithful. He was always faithful. Amen. It's not about how much you make. It's about how well you steward it. God will not let the devil devour your resources when you give him your first and your best. 
When you worship God with your giving, and I'm not just talking money, volunteering at church, serving others, discipling men, being discipled, that's aligning yourself with the will of God. And there's only safety and security within God's will. I know the devil tells you otherwise. I know the devil tells you otherwise. But I will tell you that the only safe place is within the will of the Lord. Amen. So, I want to wrap this up. It's, I want to be a good steward of time. It's a stewardship uh, class. But the big lie that we hear, if you had more money, you could help more people. Money's the answer to all your problems. And I will tell you, if you're not helping people on a minimum wage salary, you're not going to help anybody on a millionaire salary. God's given you this opportunity to learn, to steward, and shepherd, and bless other people. And when he knows he can trust to give through you, then he knows he can start to give to you. But until then, he's going to protect you from it. He's going to protect you from being one of the 73% of people who win a lottery and are bankrupt within three years. So I ask you the question, what, what other lies are Satan telling you? What other lies is he spreading about the, I put it in quotations, the saving grace of more money? What other lies is he telling you? See, we get the opportunity to work with people a lot, struggling, needing a little this and a little that. And, and as a church, the elders, we've, we, we don't just give benevolence. We don't just give money. We give training and teaching and opportunities to not fall back in that hole again. But Satan, well, if I just had a little money, if I just had a little, getting this, you know, a little overtime, it's not going to solve your problems. That's the, that's the symptom, not the source. The source of these issues is mammon. So, my last point that I want to make, and then I'm going to give you some time, and, and, uh, and if you need Ellie to come up and play a little worship while you make a calendar appointment, I really do. I want you to, to put a tangible calendar appointment and keep it. But Jesus has redeemed us from the demonic spirit of mammon. He has redeemed us. You know, Philippians 4.19 tells us, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. God, the owner of everything, supplies your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Jesus has redeemed us from the demonic spirit of mammon. <clears throat> God has given you the opportunity to learn to steward well. So what I want to do at this point, I want to, I want to pray a prayer. I want to pray a prayer of deliverance from the spirit of mammon. And I want you to just, just you sit where you are to receive it. Create some space, some, some intimacy between you and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and if allow me to pray this over this body. And allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to show you areas of mammon. See, the, the thing about the devil is he's got one trick, but he's masterful at it. From that forbidden fruit to the last temptation you had today. One trick. And he's so masterful at it that a lot of times it can only be revealed through the transformation of your mind, through the conviction of the word of the Lord. So I will pray this prayer of deliverance from the spirit of mammon. And, and, I, and I ask you, if you would, if you would just be open to the, to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Allow him to show you any areas, any areas of your life where there's an unhealthy attachment to materialism. So, Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, seeking your deliverance from the spirit of mammon. I acknowledge that you are our provider and that all things come from you. I repent for any times I have placed my trust in money or material possessions instead of in you. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. Break any hold that the spirit of mammon has over my life. Help me to trust 
and your provision and to seek first your kingdom and righteousness. Teach me, Lord, to be content with what I have and to use my resources for your glory. Lord, help me to obey Holy Spirit, and guide me in managing my finances according to your will. Lord, give me wisdom and discernment to make decisions that honor you. Help me to be generous and to store up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. I renounce any allegiance to the spirit of mammon. I choose to serve you, Lord, with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. Lord, thank you for your love, for your grace, and your provision. I trust in your promises and rest in your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, thank you. If we stand as the body, and let, let me pray us out as the body. And, and, and so what, um, well, Armando was so strong. I think I'm going to have him stand at the door and check your phones before he lets you out. <laughs> Nobody's getting through that brick wall, brother. But I look, I'm serious. I'm serious. Give it a shot. If, it, if the Lord back in the, the, in the Exodus said, make appointment and have him here in three days, I want to talk to my managers of my resources. It holds true today. God's got a word for you. But, you. but honor him by making an appointment. So, Lord, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We're so grateful for these gatherings. Lord, so grateful that we're in Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church, that we are an equipping church, that we move in the gifts, we move in the spirit, we move in the, in the offices of ministry. Lord, I thank you for, for allowing us to come here to really, truly understand and to gain a biblical perspective on what healthy stewardship is. Lord, I I pray for for this body. I pray for the folks here and and the families and the people online. I do. I bind up the demonic spirit of mammon. I bind up the demonic spirit of, of poverty. I bind up the demonic spirit of fear. And I loose 2 Timothy 1.7 what the Lord has given us, which is power, love, and a sound mind. I loose that over this body. It is through power, love, and a sound mind that we can receive the promise of Deuteronomy 8.18 that you give us wisdom to generate wealth. I declare these scriptures from the old and the new promises of the covenant over the lives of this body. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We honor you with our first, with our best. Lord, we look forward to our first calendar appointment, to the special word, the special instruction from the owner to the manager. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.